Hello, and thank you so much for having me. And um, I had been told that my mentor, Marshall Wolf, was going to be introducing me. So I just wanted to say something special to Marshall, um, who is going to be receiving an award later today. Marshall, first of all, I am honored to be here with all of you amazing women. I'm also really honored to be here in the presence of my mentor, Marshall Wolf. Um, it is really quite something to be standing at some point on a podium with somebody who uh, has formed and been a big part of my leadership um, and my career. Um, Marshall, about 20 years ago, as my residency director, actually I had been out for a few years, you said something to me that changed my life. Um, all of my former co-residents at the time, I had been, I was a few years out and into my fellowship, uh, were doing what seemed like amazing research, making, uh, getting grants, NIH grants, advancing their careers, and I was pregnant with my third child. I was working night shifts. I was spending what felt like most of my time either breastfeeding or eating macaroni off of my kids' plates. And then <laughs> I saw you at um, some Brigham celebration, and um, I was mortified. You were my mentor. I always wanted to make you proud. And I avoided you, but at some point during that event, I found myself confiding this self-doubt to you. And you looked at me and you said, you could take you know, five or even 10 years off and you could still do amazing things, so go and be a mom right now. And I wanna thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. As always, you were, you were wise, you were supportive, and you were inspiring. And uh, thank you for all that you've done, not only for me, but for countless women uh, everywhere. So now, I would like to tell you all about a different moment that changed my life and transformed my medical practice. I'm gonna take you back, oh, I need, there we go. I'm gonna take you back to the year 2003. I was a new ICU doctor at a trauma center in inner city Newark, New Jersey. It was level one trauma, it was a lot of action, and I was in the middle of it, and I loved it. I had a patient in bed five of the ICU, and she had metastatic breast cancer, and she was really sick. Her kidneys had started to fail, she was very, very acidotic, and the team asked me to insert a quitin catheter into her neck so that they could do dialysis. Made sense. She was hyperkalemic, she was very acidotic. So I talked to the husband, I explained the procedure, I explained what, what it would do for her, I explained the risks, I explained how we would handle any risks, pneumothorax, bleeding. I sent him off to the waiting room. And then I got ready to do the procedure. I swabbed the patient's neck, I covered her in drapes, I put on my sterile gloves, my medical student put on his sterile gloves and our gowns, and I put her in Trendelenburg, and I got ready to insert the needle. And at that moment, I felt someone uh, watching me from the doorway. And I looked up, and it was Pat Murphy. Pat Murphy, an advanced practice nurse who ran what was called the family support team. This was 2003, five years before palliative care would become accepted under the American uh, Board of Internal Medicine as a subspecialty. Certainly never heard of it. This family support team, would, what I would find later, would become the precursor of the, of the palliative care team at that hospital. And the point that their point, their mission was to enhance communication in the intensive care unit. Okay, well, I thought I was doing a pretty good job communicating with my patients. Um, and I didn't really know what they were doing there. And, and you know, every time I turned around, there they were like, looking over my shoulder, asking me if I had communicated clearly, if I was thinking about treating that kind of, that pain that that patient in bed four was feeling. And I'm gonna admit it to you, I sort of felt like they were these touchy-feely people. I wasn't really sure what they were doing there. They couldn't possibly understand my job. I had trained at the Brigham. I had trained at UCSF. I had gotten very good training. I knew how to do this. So I took what they said with a grain of salt. But now, Pat was standing there. She was glaring at me. And suddenly she took her hand up to her face like she was holding a pretend telephone. And she said, call the police. They're torturing a patient in the ICU. I was horrified. I mean, how could she think I was trying 
I was torturing somebody. I was really just trying to be a hero. So I'm standing there and I all of a sudden feel this wave of shame because I'm realizing what I'm about to do to this woman, it's not gonna help her. It's just gonna hurt her. She's dying. But the machine, the dialysis machine had been brought next to the room and it was waiting. They had put us up to the top of the list. They were all waiting anxiously for me to get that catheter and so they could immediately start that dialysis. And the husband was in the waiting room thinking I was gonna do something to help his wife. And my medical student was next to me eager to see this procedure, which he needed to learn how to do. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm ashamed to say it, but I did put that catheter in. And as you can imagine, it didn't change that patient's life at all, but it changed mine. Within a few days, Pat, who had been my nemesis, became my mentor and my friend. And she introduced me to this relatively unknown field of palliative care medicine. And she showed me that this prolonged life at all costs mentality that I had absorbed, that I had been a part of, was actually, while it of course works for some, was causing a tremendous amount of suffering in many of my patients, particularly those with life-limiting illness, terminally ill, the frail, the dying. And yet, we use it indiscriminately by default. Pat's words continue to guide me and to inspire me. And I often say that I learned some of my most valuable lessons about being a doctor from a nurse. I saw Pat recently, at, actually last year, at the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, and I signed my book for her. I don't know if you can read the inscription, but it says, Dear Pat, do you still want to call the police on me? So I'm here to advocate for a new model of heroism. But to understand the new model, we really need to quickly take a look at the old one. The fantasy of immortality is almost as old as humanity itself. Anyone here know about the ancient Greek myth of Eos and Tithonus? Any hands? Well, Eos was the goddess of the dawn and Tithonus was her human lover. And Eos went to Zeus's chambers and she said, Zeus, can you please grant Tithonus eternal life? And to her great surprise, Tithonus said, I mean, Zeus said, yeah, okay. She was thrilled, but as she was walking out of the chamber, she realized her dreadful mistake. And she had asked for eternal life, but what she really had wanted to ask for was eternal youth. And you can imagine how this story goes. Eos spent eternity caring for Tithonus as his mind deteriorated and his body became frail. We want to live forever. We want to find that magic pill, that miracle cure. You know, this morning I was watching TV and within a span of about seven minutes between two CNN segments, I saw, and I'm not kidding, four pharmaceutical-induced or Cancer Center Treatment of America-induced um, commercials that talked about curing the incurable or some such. I mean, look at the popularity of shows like ER or Grey's Anatomy. Why do we love them? Because every week we get to witness at least one miracle of modern medicine. We are watching doctors pull rabbits out of their scrubs. I mean, who wouldn't want a doctor like that? Who wouldn't want to be a doctor like that? The world of modern medicine allows physicians to act out this fantasy. We rush in like we're firefighters, grab and rescue any form of life from the flames. Keep that heart beating. I mean, when it works, it's miraculous. It is the most amazing experience to rescue someone from the jaws of death and send them home to their family. But far too often, patients who are truly, truly approaching the ends of their lives are also getting swept up into this life-saving fervor, and the result is devastating. I call it the end-of-life conveyor belt. It's the automatic, 
unquestioning application of increasingly powerful tools and technology that take over for the patient's organs as they begin to fail one by one. You know, you've got a ventilator when the heart, when the lungs are failing. You've got hemodialysis when the kidneys start to go. You've got defibrillation, uh, CPR, when the heart starts acting up. And you've got pressors when the blood pressure starts to flag. The body's sort of becoming encased in life support as it passes through the stages of dying. And the last stop is really not pretty. Long-term acute care, ventilator facilities. Patients there lie in beds, often with their arms tied down, with tubes in every orifice. You know, my husband, when I was writing this book, said to me, have you ever been to a ventilator facility? And in all my years of practicing critical care, I have to admit I had never been until about a year ago when I went. And it really was what I sort of had expected it to be. We don't really know what it looks like. We don't want to know what it looks like as we send patients over there. We don't want to tell our patients what it looks like. It's too painful to tell them of the repeated trips back and forth to the intensive care unit for septic shock from decubitus ulcers and the types of infections that are expected when bodies lie immobilized with tubes entering them. Has anybody here heard the term chronic critical illness? Any hands? Couple? You're going to hear that term a lot more. I believe that it was coined in 2015. That was the first time I saw it. And it really describes patients who are so debilitated as to require full-time care in institutions, most of them on machines to keep their bodies alive. And, you know, in 2015, as I told you, there was the, when I first heard about this term, a study that was done uh, in critical care medicine showed 3 million consecutive ICU admissions and looked at what percentage of those ended up with chronic, cr chronic critical illness, and it was 8%, which is 250,000 in this one study. And as our elderly population grows, as our baby boomers start reaching the age of, of, of 65, which started in 2011, we're going to see a real skyrocketing in this number, in this prevalence of this condition. And so we are caught in the middle of a perfect storm. We've got this unattainable fantasy of perpetual life, and we've got the technology to chase it. And that is leading to immeasurable suffering. Did you know, I'm sure many of you have heard this statistic, that 80% of people say that they would want to die at home. Well, unfortunately, in most of the country except for Oregon, only half of that number actually are dying at home. And that 40% is actually an overestimate. It's kind of misleading, and I'll tell you why. An increasing number of those 40% are arriving home very, very late in the game, within a day or maybe two of their deaths. Joan Tino, the healthcare researcher, calls this a burdensome transition, and that is rising rapidly, that percentage of people. 60% of patients are dying in hospitals, nursing homes, and other healthcare facilities. 28.5% of Americans are spending days in the ICU right before they die. And that number is also rising. 60% are dying in pain. That's not the way I want to die. And most healthcare providers that I know agree. Now, some of my colleagues have threatened to get a do not resuscitate order on their chest. And then a few years ago, I was at this conference at UCSF called Mindfulness in the ICU. There were very few doctors there, unfortunately, but there were a lot of nurses and a lot of other healthcare professionals. And I heard this ICU nurse say, no one's touching me, I've got a tattoo. And I looked at her skeptically and she showed me this. I don't know if you can see it, but it says, no code. <laughs> so she did it. You know, most healthcare providers are not going to go, oh, I've got five minutes that far. But apparently many feel the same way. So in this 2013 Stanford study, over 88% of over 1,000 physicians surveyed said that if they were terminally ill, they would want to be considered do not resuscitate. And patients, when they're asked, feel the exact same way. More than half of people said that being dependent on a breathing machine was a fate that they would consider worse than death. Worse than death. 
to be living on a breathing machine. But we're not asking for their opinions. Instead, we're just too busy following our protocols automatically and efficiently like a conveyor belt. So sisters, here we are wanting to change the world. Now what can we do differently going forward? Well, here's some ideas. First, let's expand our definition of success. I used to believe that it could only mean fighting disease and winning. But you can't cure dying. And trying to cure it, as I've shown you, can cause profound suffering. If that's what the patient wants, I'm all in. But over the course of my career, I have found that almost no one wants that when you really describe to them what it entails. And the data show the same thing. Treating people like widgets on a conveyor belt might be efficient, but it's inhumane. Second, we must be honest. There is a huge elephant in these hospital rooms. Doctors and patients are in completely different realities. There's some data that I'm going to show you that shocked me about patients who are on the verge of receiving tracheostomies for prolonged dependence on ventilators. Looking at their loved ones, the people who are making decisions, their surrogates, and the doctors, and what they thought was going to be the situation for that patient in one year. As you can see, the loved ones, 93% of them thought that the patient would still be alive. 71% thought they'd be living independently. And 83% thought that they would have a good quality of life. But the doctors thought very differently. Look at the discrepancy. It's chilling. Doctors, we've got to tell our patients the truth. Our patients are going to follow us into these losing battles if we lead them there. They can't plan for a good death if they don't know they're dying. Now, breaking bad news is really hard. It takes skill. It takes practice. And I'm a palliative care doctor now for the past 10 years, and it's still hard for me. Who doesn't want to just be the hope doctor, the it's going to be okay doctor? But we've got to figure out how to do it. We've got to do better. I want to tell you a very quick story about a colleague of mine. I was in the ICU. I was watching him round with a bunch of residents, medical students, fellows, and they were talking about a 38-year-old who was dying. They had pulled out all stops, and this guy was still dying. And my friend said to the team, I think we've got to think about a change. And the team was silent. No one said a word. And I felt this discomfort, having been in that position myself, of like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm the bad doctor. I'm the weak doctor. I'm talking about giving up. He took out a piece of paper from his binder. He ripped it up into eight pieces and passed it around. He said, OK, everyone, you know the drill. Zero to 10. Zero means there's no chance he's getting out of the ICU. 10 means he's going home. What do you think everyone thought? Zeros and ones. If we can't talk about this stuff, if it's such a stigma to talk about someone not getting better, we're never going to stop putting people on the end-of-life conveyor belt. So, sorry, that, that was his ballot box. The final thing that we can do, which I think is appropriate for this audience, is to talk about pulling together the best teams possible to care for our seriously ill patients. This hierarchical structure that we've been using, where the doctor's driving at all the decision making, and everyone else is just coming along for the ride, including the patient, is not working. In my experience, it's the nurse who usually knows the patient best. And social workers and chaplains and the patient have a lot of information that will be very useful to making decisions. We have got to be pulling a full team, a full toolbox into these decisions instead of just using a hammer. If we stick to this hierarchical approach, we are just going to be continuing to put people back on the end of life conveyor belt. Many of you are going to be doctors on these teams going forward. We are collaborators, we women. Let's figure out how to bring a collaborative spirit into the care of these seriously ill patients. These three steps that I just outlined will go a long way towards creating a healthier medical ecosystem for all of us, not just the patients and the families, but also for the healthcare providers who care for them. And this new system, this new heroism, will allow more people to live as they choose right up until the very end. So I've shared some harsh realities, but I've also given you some ways forward. We have a lot of work to do, and it's hard work. We're up against an infrastructure that doesn't support healthcare providers to provide patient-centered care, and we're living in a culture that doesn't want to talk about it. But the truth is, 
We've got to do something, and I need to stop. <laughs> Thank you.